Ready, set, go. Throw. 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 Yo, what the fuck? I ain't karate kid. No fear, no mercy, no love, no You can't hurt me, you can't hurt me, you can't hurt me, you can't stop me, you can't drop me, you can't block me. This is the tactic. You can't drag me, you can't shake me, don't like me. This is the tactic. You can't stop me, you can't drop me, you can't block me. This is the tactic. You can't drag me, you can't shake me, don't like me. Sweep the leg. 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 Yeah. 
You guys doing okay? That was like, out of a one to 10, that was like a four and a half. So this is what we're gonna do. I need everybody on this side of the room, on your right, I need you to make some noise, okay? To, see, to just show everybody on the left side of the room what's really going on. So how's the right side of the room doing? How y'all doing? Okay, 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 okay. The guy in the gold pants, he was kinda, he was kinda dissing them over there, but everybody on the left side of the room, how we doing tonight? I mean, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. All right, so here's the deal. You know, I just didn't think it would be fair if we came all the way here and we just didn't introduce ourselves because I'm really believing, like, we're going to have fun. We're going to jump around and get crazy. But, man, I just want you to know, here, listen to this. God, man, God's presence is with us right now amen god's presence is in this room and i'm telling you listen to this this, like god is gonna do something huge this week i believe it he's gonna do something tonight and it's starting right now okay so i just want that's why we're here we're here to give glory and honor to god see when we worship it's really fun to jump around and do crazy things But when we worship, we're declaring God's goodness over our situations and our circumstances. We're saying, thank you, God, for who you are. Thank you for for what you've done and and believing in faith for what you're going to do. And so I just want to set the standard for worship that this week, that it's not about us. We don't worship based on a feeling, but based on who our God is. Okay, amen. Everybody agree with that? Come on. But here's the deal. Some practical situations, you know. We're gentlemen up here. You know, we're, we're Southern gentlemen. And so we just got to introduce ourselves, okay? Because it just would be rude if we did not. So my name's Garrett. Everybody say, hey, Garrett. Say, you're the best in the band, Garrett. Man, you guys did not have to say that. Like, that's way too kind. Guys, I'm the best. I'm the best. No, these guys are really the best, okay? So everybody, give it up for Nick Murphy on the bass guitar. Come on. I've known Nick for a while. He's such a good dude. Glad he's playing bass with me. And on the electric guitar, the old man of the group, everybody. Give it up for Jordan Davis. Everybody say, hey, Jordan. And my good friend laying it down on the drums. Can we make some loud noise for my drummer, John Anthony? John Anthony loves drums, but he really wants to be a professional golfer. And laying it down, the music director, the glue of the band, the red-headed, beautiful man, the king himself. Give it up for Joshua Bishop, everybody. Come on. <laughs> All right. Okay, so now that you know our names, I have to know your name. So on the count of three, what is your name? One, two, three. All right, what's up, Jeff? How we doing? Good to meet you. You guys, are y'all good to keep singing? We good to sing? All right, we got a few more songs. Come on, let's worship. Let's posture our heart to who God is. Let's sing together. Come on, here we go. Let's get our hands together. As we sing, we praise you. Let everything... And that silence sees the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Come on, let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name. Sing your name in the dark, and it changes everything. We sing with all we are when we claim your victory. Come on, every voice. Hey! We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever is in your heart. Fish and cry, God, we praise you too. Let faith be 
sing together yeah come on let's keep singing you sound beautiful yeah come on let's sing the weapon may be formed the weapon may be formed but it won't prosper who in the darkness falls it won't prevail cause the God I serve knows only how triumph oh my God will never fail come on yeah oh my God sing it come on shout it oh I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory come on for the power belongs to just remember that no matter what you're going through you're not going through it alone amen that Jesus is with you come on there's power there's power in the mighty name of Jesus who every war he wages he will win no I'm not backing down from any giant come on and I know how this story Yes, I know how this story ends. Come on, lift your voice. Oh, I'm gonna see you.
sing it over your life. Come on, lift your voice to heaven right now. I'm going to see a victory. Come on. sing this truth out that he takes what the enemy meant for evil and he's turning it around he's turning it around for our good come on let's sing it together you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good holy believe it's true you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good come on you turn it for good. Oh, you're turning it around. You take the enemy and for evil, and you turn it for good. God, you turn it for good. Oh, you are working it out. You take the enemy and for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, lift it up. Hey. about worship is I love that when we sing these truths that are based in scripture and from scripture, the word of God, right? Just straight scripture that we're singing, the living word of God, is that when we start to sing, it begins to do something supernatural. Our perspective literally begins to shift. Maybe you came in here and you're like, Garrett, you don't know my story. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what's happening in my home. You don't know me, man. I don't. 
but I know a creator, his name is Jesus. He knows you, he loves you, he is for you, he is not against you. There is mercy and grace and salvation and forgiveness for you. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if you draw near to him, if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. So if you need a breakthrough right now, I know this is night one, but we're going in. If you need a breakthrough, if you're like Garrett, man, I just need a touch from God. My family's jacked up. My life is messed up. I hate going to school. I feel insecure. I'm dealing with depression, anxiety, doubt. I don't even know who God is. If you need a touch from God, would you just do something? There's no judgment in this place. But would you lift both hands towards heaven right now? Come on, if you just need a touch from God. Come on, just lift both hands towards heaven. There ain't no judgment. I need a touch from God. I need God right now. Come on. This is just a sign of saying, God, I surrender. God, I need you. God, I long for you. God, I want you. God, I desire you. God, I'm hungry for your presence. God, and I'm, I'm here because I'm vulnerable. Come on, let's sing it. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. And I'm going to see a victory. Shout it. Hey. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. And I'm gonna see a victory, Lord, for the battle. Hey. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. And I'm gonna see a victory, Lord, for the battle. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory. Sing this, you take, you take, hey! hey! You take the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you are working it out, my God. You take the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Hey! Come on, let's give him a shout. Amen. Come on. Come on. Hey. Thank you, Lord. You guys good to sing one more? And I search the world. Come on. But it couldn't fill me. Treasures that fade are never enough. Come on, yeah. Then you came along. Thank you, Lord. And put me back together. Sing it. In every desire. Come on. Because there's nothing. Oh, there. Come on, do you know that to be true? That there's nothing better than Jesus. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Hey. And I'm not afraid. Come on. To show you my weakness. Yes, Lord. My failures and the loss. Lord, you've seen them all. And you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain. Cause the God of the mountain yeah. He's the God of the valley Come on, it's true And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me Better 
some of y'all need to dance. Some of y'all need to dance. I can't dance, but I'm going to dance. Come on. Let's do it. Hey! You said morning to dancing. Come on. You give beauty for ashes. Come on. You turn shame into glory. You're the glory. You turn morning to dancing. Oh, yes, you do. you but it's gonna be a good week of camp it's gonna be so good so good hey what can you do something before you take a seat will you just toss one high five to somebody on your left to your right and say you're awesome and then you guys grab a seat talk about Daniel, a royal from Judah, a man raised among the reigning family of God's chosen people until Babylon conquered. Daniel was led in chains to a land unfamiliar, given a station of submission to one king in particular who praised himself above God in a culture of idolatry and sin. So Daniel learns to live within a culture that hated his God, a culture that celebrated sin, a culture that hated him for his religion. That sounds a lot like being a Christian, but here's the thing. Among the people in his position, Daniel was different. When the king gave command for all wise men to die, Daniel turned to God. When the king had a dream that no man could explain, Daniel turned to God. And when the king ordained that people who pray would be thrown to the lion's den, Daniel turned to God? 
Tell me, how extreme must a man's faith be to pray when it may cost your life? That's a trick question, you see. Daniel knew who he was praying to. He knew that the authority of a Babylonian king to decide who lives and who dies could not coincide nor begin to compare to the sovereignty of God in heaven. And Daniel's friends knew that the power of a human king to command any man to bow at his whim was so far below the king of creation that it need not receive recognition. So when they were commanded, to worship an idol, Daniel's friends turned to God. And when they were threatened with a furnace of fire, Daniel's friends turned to God because like Daniel, they were sure who they were living for. In God's hands, the roaring of lions was silenced. The mouths of deadly beasts were clamped shut as God held them at bay in their hunger to protect his servant, Daniel. God was in control even in the lion's den. God was in control even in the flames. In God's hands, the same flames that waged so strongly to kill the mighty men of Babylon was incapable of singeing a single hair on the heads of his servants. God's people walked out of the flames without even the smell of fire upon them because God is still in control. God is still more sovereign than all of the governments in this world. God is still more powerful than anything that stands against us. And God is still worthy of our obedience, our honor, our praise, our submission. Because like Daniel, you and I are in a position to turn against the tide and serve God among a people who celebrate sin. Fires of temptation and pain still rage around us. Beasts of this world are waiting to devour us, stalking our families, destroying our friendships, and gnawing on the wounds that cut us deepest. So when society tells us we can revel in sin, like Daniel, we must turn to God. When society convinces us to give in to our desires, like Daniel, we must turn to God. And when society tells us to follow our heart, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow the heart of Christ. Because like Daniel, we are sure who we are living for. And God is in control even in the midst of this world. All right, Staycation, how are y'all tonight? Good, I hope good, good. All right, hey, if you have a Bible, go to Daniel chapter one. Daniel chapter one, uh, we are gonna hang out there. If you don't have a Bible, uh, just grab one of those in the pew in front of you and just keep that with you the rest of the week. Uh, that is your door prize for coming to Staycation. All right, all right. So before I get going, I'd like to know who I'm talking to, and there's really only two groups in here that matter. So first are the seniors. Where are the seniors at? Yeah, all right. Hey, small in number and points this week, right? Um, all right, uh, so any sixth graders? Where are the sixth graders at? Yes, all right, good. That is what I like to hear. I love sixth graders. I love sixth grade boys uh, specifically because of this. Uh, you can give a sixth grade boy a bag of Skittles some Mountain Dew and a water pistol, and they will charge the gates of hell with you, right? Uh, like, he's so excited about everything. I love it, all right? Uh, so my name's Ethan. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm excited to get to spend some time with you tonight. So Daniel chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Uh, we're going to look at verses 8 to 21. All right, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 uh, to 21. So no one gets uh, where they want to go by accident, right? And no one gets to be who they want to be by accident. No, no one uh, gets to become who they want to become uh, by chance, right? None of us are like Bob Ross trees, happy little accidents, right? That, that's not any of us. If we know who we want to become, we know who we want to be, we know what we want to be like, it takes intentionality right? Uh, it takes us doing something. Uh, so uh, some of you might know. Now, it's been said that we all have doppelgangers, right? Anyone know what a doppelganger is? Uh, that they, everyone has a twin. So um, I, I don't like to tell people this a lot, but I've been told that my doppelganger is a guy named Tim Tebow. Anyone know who Tim Tebow is? Okay. All right. Laugh, whatever. Uh, uh, so Tim Tebow 
Disciplined guy, right? Uh, he just signed a contract with the greatest NFL team to ever play the game, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, am I right? Yes, thank you, thank you. We have some Christians in the room, praise the Lord, right? Uh, so uh, Tim Tebow, uh, this is Tim Tebow now. He just signed a contract with the Jaguars to play tight end. Uh, but before this, uh, Tebow stopped playing football for a little while and started playing baseball. And this is what Tebow looked like as a baseball player. Now, if you look at this picture and the other picture, picture you'll notice something different, right? Uh, so here, like his arms are big, but not serious. Like go to the next picture for me. Like, look at that, right? Man, like that dude is jacked. He is strong. I saw a meme the other day. It said like Tebow been lifting more than Bibles, right? Like that dude is big, right? But Tebow didn't get there on accident, right? He, he, he didn't get there by chance. He, he didn't just say one day, hey, I want to play in the NFL uh, and then ate like Big Macs and drank a bunch of Coke and then ended up like that, right? Uh, he, it took time. It, it took working out. It took dedication. It took intentionality, right? Uh, none of us get to be what we want to be. None of us get to go where we want to go on accident. This week, we're going to study the book of Daniel. And as we dig in to the book of Daniel, we're going to unpack this theme of against the tide. And as we start this week, uh, I want us to spend some time. We're going to look at Daniel chapter 1. And we're going to spend some time thinking about this idea of standing against the tide. And as we look at Daniel 1, this is what we're going to see. Standing against the tide doesn't happen by accident. Right? Standing against the tide doesn't happen by accident. We can't just say, hey, I, I want to stand strong. I, I want to I be who God has called me to be. I, I, I want to do what God has called me to do. And I'm just going to float into it. I, I'm just going to drift into it, right? Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had some friends that had, uh, they were staying in Orlando, and so we went to go see them, and uh, the resort that they were staying at had a lazy river. And I'm a big fan of, I was a big fan of lazy rivers, and then I had kids, and like all of a sudden, lazy rivers became work, right? Because I'm trying to make sure like, this kid doesn't drown, and this kid doesn't drown, and this kid doesn't run into that lady over there because she looks mean, and, and different things like that. And I could just sit in that river and just go around and around and around. It was going to take me wherever it wanted to go. That's what, what our culture does, right? That, that the world that we live in, if we don't stand against the tide, we just kind of float to, to wherever uh, the, the culture, wherever the world wants us to go. And, and so what we're going to see tonight is that uh, as Christ followers, that's not an option for us. That is Christ followers, is people who are following Jesus, we've got to stand against the tide and we've got to be intentional, right? We don't accidentally follow Jesus, right? We don't accidentally become like Jesus. So look with me at Daniel chapter one. We're going to read a pretty good chunk, verses eight down to 21. This is a story. So we need to see what's going on. I'll go back in and, and fill in kind of some of the, the beforehand here in just a minute. So Daniel chapter one. Verse 8, the Holy Spirit says to us, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king? Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of time, 
At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this time that we can come here together tonight and this week. And Lord, we pray that, that even now you would speak to us. Lord, we pray that, that you would show us what you would have us to see in your word. That you would prepare us to stand against the tide. And so, Father, we pray this and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we pick up in the book of Daniel. Daniel and his buddies, they find themselves in Babylon. Uh, they're, they're Jews, they're, they're Israelites, uh, and because of Israel's sin, uh, God is punishing them. And the way he's punishing them is he's using this wicked kingdom, this, this wicked country, and this wicked king named Nebuchadnezzar. And so they find themselves in Babylon, and they find themselves even ripped from their families. They've been brought into the king's court. They've they've been brought into this strange place because they stood out. Now understand, to go from Israel to Babylon is not like us moving from Florida to North Carolina or from Florida to Oregon. Now, moving from Israel to Babylon is like moving from the United States to North Korea. Right, It's like moving from the familiar to the completely unfamiliar, to the completely unknown, to the completely new, and to the completely different. They moved to a place that they weren't welcomed in, that they weren't liked, but this king has brought them in because these were the guys that in high school, these were the guys that made all the good grades, that were super athletic, that were Mr. All-American, that it just seemed like everything they touched turned to gold. And so the king sees these guys and he brings them in and he says, look, I want them for me, right? I want them to work for me. Now, Daniel and his buddies, they're probably between the ages of like 14 to 16. So anyone in here that age, 14, 15, 16, uh, some of you, all right, yes, some of you aren't sure, right? You've got to ask your mom or look at your driver's license or, or something like that. So just imagine for a moment, maybe you're not 14, 15, or 16. Maybe you know a 14, 15, or 16-year-old. But just imagine, right, they have or you have been snatched from your homeland, snatched from everything that you know, and dropped in this place where everything is different, where everything is strange, and where everything is completely opposed to everything that you know. So I like sports, as you can tell, and because I'm a Christian, I'm a Florida Gator fan. Uh, So, yes, thank you. Thank you, God's people. It's good to be with you. Um, And so uh, this would be like me being picked up and dropped in the middle of Tallahassee, in the middle of Florida State Seminole Country, and said, all right, Ethan, you will do the war chant, you will sing our songs, and you will know our players right? And this is something that I'm not prepared for. I don't know. I, I don't care necessarily about Florida State's history or any of that, but I'm going to be made to care. That's what's happening here, right? The Nebuchadnezzar has taken this group of, uh, of kids, this group of 14, 15, and 16 year old boys and said, look, I know you don't want to be here. I, I know that you aren't excited about it. And I know that you don't agree with much of what we're going to talk about, but here's the thing. You will like it. And so what happens is Nebuchadnezzar puts these guys through a three-year program where he's going to re-educate them. He is going to teach them how to be a Babylonian, how to live in Babylon. What are their stories? What is their culture? Like, what are the things that they do? What are the things that they don't do? What are the things that they say? What are the things that they don't say? He's going to make them good Babylonians. What we see is that God has other plans. What we see is that Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they, they are going to stand against the tide. They're going to stand strong. Now, you and I might not find ourselves in Babylon. 
But we are going to find ourselves sooner or later as Christ followers in a position where we need to stand against the tide. And so how do we do that? So we're going to look at a few things from this passage to teach us how do we stand against the tide. So the first thing we're going to see is this, resolve to honor God. If we are going to stand against the tide, we have to resolve to honor God. So if we were to to go back and look at verses 8 to 14 in the story, we're not going to go back and read those again. But what we see is we have Daniel and his buddies, they don't want to defile themselves with the king's food. Now, there's a few different ideas on why they wouldn't want to eat the king's food. Uh, It may have been food that was sacrificed to idols. It may have had pork in it. It most likely involved some kind of pork. And so uh, as good Israelites, they weren't going to eat pork. And some scholars think that they just wanted to retain their Jewishness, right? That they just wanted to to keep some part of their identity. They wanted to keep some part of what made them them. And so they didn't want to eat the king's food. Because here's the thing, eating the king's food aligned you with the king. Now understand, this is good food, right? I've never been into a royal palace. I've never eaten with a king, but I can tell you that if I was a king, I would eat better than all of you, right? Like, I don't don't know what it is you eat, but like, if you were eating like a steak, I'm gonna eat a better steak, right? Like, if you were gonna eat like uh, some chicken, I'm gonna eat Chick-fil-A, right? I'm gonna eat something a little bit better than whatever you are. And so understand that when Daniel and his friends, they don't wanna eat the king's food, they are turning down the best of the best, right? They are turning down good food. And so they go to the the chief eunuch who who is basically kind of runs the king's household, And I say, look, just give us vegetables and water to drink. Don't make us eat the king's food. And you remember what the eunuch said? He said, do you want me to get my head cut off? Right, do do you want me to be killed? Because if I I don't have you eat the king's food, the king's gonna be mad. And when kings get mad, people die, right? Like you've heard that phrase, like if mom ain't happy, ain't no one happy, right? Well, if the king ain't happy, everyone dies, right? Like, Like that's what happens. And so he says, look, there's no way that I'm going to let you just eat vegetables and drink water. You are going to eat this steak and you're going to be happy about it, right? You are going to eat these ribs. You're going to eat this whatever and you are going to like it. And so the chief eunuch, he brings in this guy who's the steward, who's going to kind of basically babysit or oversee Daniel and his buddies, And so Daniel goes to this steward and he says, look, let me reason with you. Give me 10 days, 10 days of just eating vegetables and drinking water. And if I look worse than the rest of the guys in this program, if we look worse than the rest of the guys that we're going through this with, we'll eat your food. And so this steward says, all right, 10 days. I'll give you 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, we'll see how you look. And so what we see in the first part of the story is this resolve to honor God. Daniel says, look, hey, I would rather honor God with what I eat than eat this really good food. I would rather eat fruits and vegetables for the rest of my days, if it means honoring God, rather than eating this meat that was sacrificed to idols, rather than eating this meat that is going to violate what God has called me to, rather than eating this meat that's going to show that I have an allegiance to the king, I'm going to eat fruits and vegetables. Now, I don't know what kind of fruits and vegetables they were eating in Babylon. But in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking that this is not a super fun diet, maybe, right? Like Daniel is preparing himself, like we're gonna eat like squash and eggplant and zucchini and other like weird vegetables that I don't even know the names of, right? Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna eat these fruits, we're gonna eat these vegetables and we're gonna look really good coming out of it. And so it would have been easy for Daniel to just eat what the king gave him. It would have been easy for Daniel to, to not make a big deal of the food because after all, it's just food, but, but that's not what we see, right? Daniel decides that he's gonna honor God in any way that he could. 
I've already said that, that Daniel and his three buddies, they're probably between the ages of 14 and 16. And, and think about this. Right, we've already said that they've been ripped from everything they know. They've been ripped from their families. They've been ripped from what is normal. And so Daniel and his buddies, they resolve to do this. They resolve to eat vegetables. They resolve to honor God. They decide that they're going to honor him, not because they have their mom or their dad or because Pastor Mike is there saying, hey, you should follow Jesus. No, they're doing this simply because they love God. Right? They're not doing this because someone is there telling them, hey, this is what good little Christian boys and girls do. They're not doing this because someone is over their shoulder saying, hey, you need to do this. No, they're doing this because they want to honor the Lord. So imagine that you're pulled from your family. You're pulled from everything familiar you're taken to a strange place. You're tempted with the finest everything. And you can have it all if you'll just decide that honoring the Lord doesn't really matter in your life. What would you do? You're offered the finest everything. Whatever it is, you can have it. All you've got to do is just forget about that God all you've got to do is just decide that that's okay, but it's not really that important. See, Daniel's resolve to honor God, it didn't just happen when he was thrown into temptation. No, Daniel's faith had been prepared for this long before he ended up at Nebuchadnezzar's dinner table. Because remember, standing against the tide doesn't happen by what? It doesn't happen by accident. Right? You don't just one day decide, hey, you know, I think that I'm going to stand strong today. I think that I'm going to just resist this temptation today. That's not the way it works, right? Like I'm not going to go to the gym in the morning and say, you know what? I think that I can bench press three elephants, right? Like, like just not going to happen. I know some of you are saying like, that dude's got the body of a Greek God. Like his arms look huge. I think he could do it, right? I think he could do it, but I can't, right? I know it's a surprise, Right? We don't just accidentally become strong. We don't just accidentally become this or that. In the same way, you just wake up one morning and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to stand strong today. Hey, you know what? I'm going to resist temptation today. No, you've got to decide long before that temptation ever comes that you are going to do it. Right? That, that you are going to stand strong and that you're going to resist whatever may come. That you're going to fight against whatever that may be. And so are you ready for that kind of test? Now, most of us won't find ourselves in Babylon. Most of us aren't going to be kidnapped, stripped from our families, and taken to a country that we don't know. But many of us will find ourselves in college. Many of us will find ourselves out from underneath wherever we're living today. Many of us will find ourselves separated from Central, separated from Encounter on Tuesday nights or Wednesday nights, separated from this or from that. And when that moment comes, will you resolve to honor God or will you decide that it's not really worth it? Because here's the thing, guys, it is super easy for you to come to staycation and to be super pumped about worship and to be excited about the games and to be, even sit in here and listen to preaching. But it is a completely different thing to decide that you are going to honor the Lord in your life whenever staycation is over. But it's a completely different thing to decide that you're going to honor the Lord with your life when you've graduated from high school. It's a completely different thing to decide that you're going to count the cost and you're going to follow Jesus no matter what, whenever it's easy. But what are you going to do when it's hard? What are you going to do when everyone around you is saying it's not really that important? It doesn't really matter. What are you going to do then? Now, some of you are like, Bro, I'm in sixth grade. I'm just trying to figure out where I put my Axe body spray at, right? <laughs> Some of you are seniors, and this is going to be your reality in weeks. All of us are going to find, us, find ourselves in that place at some point. Are we going to resolve to honor God, or are we going to decide that it doesn't really matter? Anyone ever heard the name Jonathan Edwards? Anyone ever heard this guy? So when I was in high school, the first time I'd ever heard of Jonathan Edwards, I was a sophomore 
I was in, don't remember my English teacher's name, I was in her class, and we had to read a sermon. And so I'm thinking like, I'm a good Christian young man, I'm going to read this sermon. And so we read this sermon, maybe you've heard of it, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So Edwards is, is famous for that, he's, he's famous for some other things, but uh, Jonathan Edwards, when he was 18 or 19, any 18-year-olds in here, 19-year-olds, anyone in here going to be 18 or 19 one day, like maybe, <laughs> you, might, you might live that long, yeah. Um, so Edwards, he was 18, 19, he starts writing out this, this list of resolutions, and he carried it on for a few months, writing out these resolutions, and he ended up with 70 in total. And some of them were just like kind of good life practices. Some of them were, were different things. But the first two, they're, they're kind of long, but they can be summed up like this. The first resolution is this. Resolved, I will live for God. The second resolution is if no one does, I still will. Edwards wrote that when he was 18 or 19. He was preparing himself because he knew that there was going to come a day when he was going to be in a situation where he might be the only one who had decided that he was going to honor God with his life. And he decided in that moment that right now I'm going to decide that I am going to honor the Lord. And so that's my question for you tonight. Uh, right now, are you willing to say, hey, you know what? If I'm going to live to honor God, and if no one else does, I'm still going to. And like I said, it's easy to say that right now, right? It's easy to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to live for Jesus, but what are you going to do when you find yourself in that, that Babylon-like situation? What are you going to do when you find yourself and no one around you loves Jesus? Are you still going to honor God or not? So how do you do that? Because here's the thing, you can't honor God in your own strength in that season, in that moment. So, so how do you do it? So we see first, you've got to resolve to honor God. Next, we see this, that you've got to recognize God's grace. You've got to recognize God's grace. So in verses 15 and 16, we see this played out. So we're never going to stand against the tide of our world and our culture and our own strength. We need something more. We need God's grace. See, standing against the tide, right, doesn't happen by accident. We don't do it on our own. We need God's grace to empower us to stand. And so Daniel and his friends, remember, they've, they've made this request. They've said, hey, look, Mr. Steward, whatever his name is, I like to think that his name was probably like Bob or Tim, but I, I don't know what the Babylons, Babylonians named their, their sons at this point. But let's say Bob, all right? Uh, hey, Bob, give me 10 days, Give us 10 days, let us eat fruits, vegetables, and we'll drink water, and we guarantee that our God will sustain us and we'll come out better on the other side. He says, all right. He probably says something like, don't tell anyone, right? Don't, don't let anyone else know. Uh, I doubt that anyone's going to beat them up for their squash, right? Uh, but hey, just don't let anyone else know. And so Verse 14, the steward says, all right, you can do it. Verse 15, we see that, that they didn't just make it through looking okay. Right? In verse 15, it says, at the end of 10 days, now that number 10 is important. We're going to come back to that in a minute. It, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. Right? Let's just stop right there. What would you do if someone said like, hey, you look kind of fatter in flesh than everyone else, right? I like that. I like that. You're looking good, Right? Uh, some of you guys, right, some of you sixth grade, grade guys are saying like, yeah, I like that. I like that. I'm going to write that in a yearbook next year or something like that, right? Don't do that. All right, don't be that guy. So he says that, that you look better in appearance. You look fatter in flesh than all the others who ate the king's food because that's what we all once said about us. And so because of this, the steward takes their food and wine and he gives them the vegetables that they had been eating. Look at verse 16. He says, so the steward took away their food and the wine. Now, stop right there. The steward took away their food and the wine. Now, now we didn't stop and camp out here, but we could have gone back and we could have looked at, the, at verses eight 
down to 14. Every time that food and wine are mentioned, it's mentioned as the king's, the king's food and the king's wine, the king's food and the king's wine. And then in verse 16, we have this switch that it's no longer the king's food and the king's wine, but now it's their food and their wine. And what the author is doing there is the author is showing that something has changed, right? That, that now the Lord has blessed Daniel and his buddies in some way that, that something has changed. And now the steward sees that, all right, there's something happening here, right? I better pay attention. There's something happening here. I, I, better, I better look into this. Now, he sees that they, they weren't able to look strong and healthy by eating only vegetables and, and drinking water in their own power, right? They didn't accomplish this by eating superfoods, right? Daniel and his buddies, they weren't just saying, all right, look, just give us kale and some sweet potatoes and some of this and some of that, and we're going to drink like some Propel water with some extra electrolytes, and that's really going to make us strong. No, they're, they're doing it in such a way as to not draw attention to themselves. And so they're just eating whatever vegetables they have. They're drinking the water as they get it. And yet they looked better than everyone else. They looked better than everyone else without even trying. They were stronger, fatter in flesh, we might say, right? Better in appearance, See, if we're going to stand against the tide, just like Daniel and his friends, it's going to take God's grace. We're never going to make it on our own. We, we might stand for a while, but eventually we will fall. Eventually we'll get tired. Eventually we'll give in. So if we need God's grace to, to stand against the tide. And really, guys, here's the truth. We need God's grace just to live, right? The only reason that you and I are breathing right now is because of God's grace. The only reason you're here tonight is because of God's grace. The only reason that you were born and brought to a place like this instead of to some other place is God's grace. We need God's grace to live and we certainly need God's grace to stand against the tide. That means that we pray, we worship, we read the Bible, we press harder into God and his grace and he empowers us to stand stronger. So to stand against the tide, we need more of God and less of everything else. Now, now get this, right? Daniel and his friends, they're in this situation where they are being inundated day after day with Babylonian myths and Babylonian stories and Babylonian culture and Babylonian this and Babylonian that. So they're, they're not being given a, a steady diet of like sound biblical teaching, right? They're not digging into the Hebrew scriptures over and over and over again. In fact, they're being deprived of them. And maybe you're saying, I, I can't even imagine what that's like to just have these, these darts just kind of thrown at me, right? So you're, you're seeing nothing but Babylonian this and Babylonian that and Babylonian this and Babylonian that. So, so that all you can think about, all you can hear, all you can feel is Babylon. And eventually you're going to begin to see yourself as a Babylonian. Now, maybe you and I aren't in that situation, but can I say this, that if you spend more time on TikTok than reading your Bible, maybe you're more like the Babylonians than you care to admit, right? If you spend more time just scrolling on Instagram or reading whatever you do on Snapchat, I've never used it, or whatever, like making like TikTok dances or whatever it may be. Is that a dance? Yeah, y'all like that? Right? Maybe, maybe you get a, a little glimpse of what it's like to be in Daniel's shoes, more of a glimpse of what it's like to be in Daniel's shoes than you actually realize. You spend your days playing Fortnite and your nights playing Candy Crush or whatever it may be, I don't know. You, you, you spend all of your time doing that. Guys, what you've got to understand is that as you get more and more of the world into you, you push more and more of God and his grace out of you, right? 
Do we need more of God and his word and his grace and less of the junk of this world? But some of us are just inviting this stuff in, right? I've got an iPhone and the worst part of my week, my relationship with my iPhone is on Sunday mornings. Because on Sunday mornings, I get the screen time report. Anyone get this? Yeah, and I think it's persecution, right? <laughs> like, I, I, I think uh, Apple is judging me, right? And I look at that screen time report, and for a while I would look at it, and I would think, there is no way that is right. And so now what I've started doing is whenever I get that notification, I just clear it before I can see it, right? Because I don't want to know, like, I don't need, yes, thank you. I don't need that kind of negativity in my life, right? But it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that, that I spend that much time on my phone. You know how much time I spent last week on my phone? I'm not going to tell you. Right? Uh, I'm not going to do that because you would judge me and then I would judge you for judging me and it just, it'd be ridiculous. Right? But, but here's the thing, guys. We spend so much time right, connected to, maybe it's not an iPhone, maybe it's something else. Guys, here's the thing, maybe you'd say, I don't use social media, but I read a lot of books. Well, guys, it's the same thing in some ways, right? Now, I think you should read books more than social media, but if you, you're constantly just losing yourself over here and, and, and this and that and, and not digging into God and his word, if you're replacing God's word with some other thing, whatever that thing may be, then you are being a lot more like a Babylonian and a lot less like Daniel. To put it another way, you're being a whole lot more like a Babylonian and a lot less like Jesus, right? And so we need more of God's grace. We need more of God's word. We need more of worshiping Jesus. We need more of gathering with our brothers and sisters to be encouraged to follow Jesus than we do anything this world has to offer. And it's only when we're convinced of that that we will be able to stand against the tide. It's only whenever we're convinced that all of this is more important than all of that, that we're going to be ready to stand against what the world throws at us. See, it's not enough uh, for you to just come, come every once in a while to staycation or to, to even come to church every week and then just decide that, hey, that's enough Jesus. That's all the Jesus that I need. And then to Fill your mind with all the junk that the world has to offer. See, what we've got to constantly be doing is we've got to do that, that Romans 12, right? That we need to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, how do you trans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind? It, the only way for your mind to be transformed is for your heart to be conformed to the image of Jesus. And that only happens through his word. Right? That only happens through praying. That only happens through digging in and, and knowing, pressing in hard to this thing called discipleship, right? To, to this following Jesus. We can't do it on our own. It's God's grace that empowers us to stand. Have you ever wondered how Paul could say to live as Christ and to die as gain? Have you ever wondered what it was like for Paul to get to that point to say, look, if I live, I'm going to follow Jesus. But if I die, that's okay because I get to go be with Jesus. Have you ever wondered, we hear stories about martyrs. I read this afternoon, as a matter of fact, I opened a book that I haven't opened in probably 10 years. It's called Voice of the Martyrs. And it's story after story after story of teenagers all the way up who decided that Jesus was worth more than anything this world had to offer. One of the stories I read was about a guy who had been arrested, a teenager had been arrested for sharing the gospel. And they said, you need to deny Jesus. You need to say that you don't believe in Jesus. And if you, if you don't, then we're going to cut your hands off. And so he said, take my hands. They cut his hands off. Read stories about people who were said, if, if you don't say that you don't believe in Jesus, then we're going to kill you. We're going to kill your family. We're going to kill your children. 
One of the stories I read was about a a child telling his dad essentially that Jesus is worth it, that Jesus is better. How do you get to that moment? How, How do you get to that point where you're ready to say that Jesus is worth me dying for if that's what it means to honor him? You don't get there on your own. Right? There's nothing inside of you that can make you do that. The natural man, the natural person doesn't want any part of that. It is only God's grace at work in you through God's spirit that gets you to that place. That gets you to where you can stand against the tide. That gets you to where you can stand in that moment and say, if no one else follows Jesus, I still will, even if that means that I die. Even if that means that I lose some friends, even if that means that I lose some opportunities, even if that means that I can't do that job that I want to do or go to that place that I want to go or be with those people that I want to be with because Jesus is worth more. The only way you get there is through God's grace, right? That, That doesn't happen on accident. You don't drift into that. The standing against the tide never happens by chance. If we're going to stand against the tide, we resolve to honor God, we recognize God's grace, and last we're going to see this, that we respond with love. So look at what happens next. God gives Daniel and his friends skill in literature and wisdom. So so basically what Daniel's saying there, he's saying that, that God gives Daniel and his friends' understanding of Babylonian culture, an understanding of Babylonian history, an understanding of, of what do the Babylonians value, what do they hold in high regard, what are the things that they celebrate, what do they think is smart, what do they think is wise, what do they think is good, what do they think is true. And what we see is that Daniel, unlike the other three, apparently had a, a special understanding of visions and of dreams. And this would have made Daniel extremely valuable and extremely important for Nebuchadnezzar, this wicked king. And it would have made him extremely valuable and extremely important because the Babylonians believed that the gods spoke through dreams. And so if you could interpret a dream, if you could tell me what a dream means, then that means that you can speak for the gods. And so suddenly Daniel becomes this important mouthpiece for Nebuchadnezzar. And what we see is that at the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. The king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel. None of them was found like his buddy. And it says, and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired, he found them 10 times. Now remember, I said we're going to come back to that 10, right? That they, uh, they ate the vegetables and the fruits for 10 days, and they were found good. What we see here is that God redeems the 10, right? God redeems those days. And he says, look, they're not just a little bit smarter than the magicians and the enchanters. They are 10 times smarter than them. It's not even close. It's not even a contest. It's not even a conversation. Daniel and his buddies are far away better, far away wiser, far away more talented than any of the other enchanters and magicians and all of that. And so at the end of their training period, they're, they're brought in before the king and no one stood out like Daniel and his friends. Every question they ask, every problem they bring They take it to Daniel, they take it to his friends, and they're blown away by Daniel's wisdom. They're blown away by his buddy's insights. Now, what we might expect here is for Daniel and his friends to be bitter, right? Look, we're friends, right? We're all friends in this room. I am what some people might call a mama's boy. All right. Thank you. All right, it's good to get that off my chest. So, like, I love my mom. I am her favorite child. Um, tell my sister, please. Uh, if you, if I'm 14, 15, 16, you rip me from my family. You rip me from everything that I know and hold dear. I don't want to be your friend, right? I don't want to help you. I don't even really like you, right? I'm going to be bitter, right? I'm not going to be happy about it. My wife tells a story about 
when she would get into trouble, her mom would make her apologize to her sisters or her brother, whoever she had wronged, and, and she would say no. And her mom would say, excuse me? And she'd say, I don't feel like it, right? So I'm not going to apologize. I'm not really sorry, right? She was a little bitter. That's what I would have been like in this situation, right? The king brings a dream or a problem, and he says, hey, Ethan, I need you to tell me what to do here. And I'm going to say, hey, kick rocks, king, right? Like, or I'm going to tell him the wrong thing, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to play some jokes. I'm going to do something like that. That's not what Daniel does. Now, Daniel responds in this situation with love. He answers the king's questions. He, he seeks the good of this place that he finds himself. What he does is he's living out this, this principle of Jeremiah 29, 7. So if you were to look over at the book of Jeremiah, if you were to go to verse, chapter 29, verse 7, you would read this. Uh, we're, Jeremiah speaking to exiles. He's speaking to those living in Babylon. He says this, Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. What Daniel's doing is rather than being bitter, rather than being angry about the situation that he finds himself in, he believes that God has brought him here for a reason. God has brought him here for a purpose. And so he is going to respond with love, not with anger. With love, not with bitterness. With love, not with wrath or with vengeance. And what we're going to see over the next few nights as we come in here and we study the book of Daniel, we're going to see how this continues to play itself out. Right? We're going to see how this continues to unfold. But for us today, this is what the Lord calls us to do and to be as Christians. We stand against the tide, not by compromising on, on who we are, not by compromising on what, the, uh, what God has called us to be, but we stand against the tide by loving those who the world says it would be okay if you didn't like. We stand against the tide by loving those who don't deserve it by loving those who haven't earned it, by loving those who maybe even put us in the position to have to stand against the tide. I mean, think about it. Nebuchadnezzar had ripped Daniel from everything he knew. He had removed him from the familiar and was trying to change what Daniel believed. But rather than being angry or bitter, Daniel knew that God had a plan for why he had placed him in this position. I think sometimes when we, we think about kind of our place in the world as people who follow Jesus, sometimes we almost approach it as, as we're, we're fighting against those people who don't follow Jesus. We're fighting against those people who would say that, that God isn't real or this or that. But what we've got to do, what we've got to reorient our minds to do is what Paul says in Ephesians, that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against other people, but we're wrestling against powers and principalities, right? Our enemy is invisible. And so we've got to understand that, that when we find ourselves in these difficult situations, the enemy is not the lost people around us. Right, the enemy is the one who has taken them captive. He's taken their hearts and their minds captive. When I, uh, my first job at a church as a pastor, I was a, a student pastor. Uh, and I walked into my office on the first day, and there was a flyer on my desk. And this flyer had like this angry looking statue of Jesus, right? Maybe you've seen those statues, like that's angry Jesus, that's loving Jesus, right? You had like angry Jesus, and then I had a picture of the world, and it said Jesus versus the world. When I flipped it over on the back, it, it had all of these topics that they were going to cover over however many weeks. I think sometimes we think that it's us and Jesus versus the world. But what we've got to understand is, is that it's not Jesus versus the world, but it's Jesus for the world, right? We all know John 3.16, or many of us probably know John 3.16. Do y'all know John 3.16? Anyone say it? For God so loved the world. Yeah, amen, right? Yeah, yeah. Some of you are like, for God so loved the world, he gives only God. So, right. Yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Does anyone know what John three seventeen says? 
It says, for Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. That Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. See, it's not Jesus coming into the world and saying, look at all of you sinners. Look at all of the problems that you've created. No, it's Jesus coming into the world and saying, look at all of you sinners that I'm going to die for. Look at all of you sinners that that I am going to make alive. Look at all of these sinners that I have come to bless. See, for Daniel, it would have been very easy for him to begin to think that these Babylonians, that they are the enemies, that they are the problem, that they are the reason that he's in this situation. And so he's not going to help him at all. But instead, what do we find Daniel doing? We find Daniel loving the place that God has placed him. Loving the people that God has put him around, even when it wasn't easy, even when it wasn't always nice, even when it doesn't always seem like maybe maybe the thing that made the most sense. See, we're called to stand against the tide, not to show how religious we are or how dedicated we are or how serious we are. No, we stand against the tide because we have a better message to share with the world. Or we stand against the tide because we want people to see and to meet Jesus. That's why. That's why we stand against the tide. Not so that people can say, well, look how committed he is. What a great Christian she is. No, we stand against the tide because Jesus is for the world. As you standing against the tide, it doesn't happen by accident. If we're going to stand against the tide, then we resolve to honor God. We recognize God's grace. We respond with God's love. And we've already said that that this doesn't happen on our own, that we can't do any of this in our own strength. In fact, if we're left to our own, we will fail. But the truth is, the good news is that there's one who stood for us. And because of what he has done, we can stand now. See, this story isn't ultimately about Daniel. See, the the point of this story is not ultimately that you need to be a Daniel, right? So sometimes we can read stories like this from the Bible and we can think, I just need to be like Daniel. Daniel is the hero of this story, but that's not ultimately what this story is about. See, this story, just like every other story in the Bible, is ultimately pointing us to Jesus. See, Jesus is the hero, not you or not me. The reason we stand strong isn't so that people can say, wow, look at him. The reason we stand strong against the tide is so that people can say, wow, look at Jesus. Look at, look at what Jesus has done. Look at what Jesus is doing. Look at what Jesus can do. See, like Daniel, Jesus would leave his home and willingly come into a sinful world without ever committing a sin. Like Daniel, Jesus would walk in wisdom, even as a child. His his teachers would be amazed by his understanding and his answers. Like Daniel, Jesus would be tempted. But unlike Daniel, Jesus is tempted by the emperor behind the emperor, right? by the, the prince of darkness, by the ultimate enemy, by Satan. But unlike Daniel, Jesus would take the judgment of sinners. Jesus would take the penalty that you and I deserved on the cross in our place. He would bear God's wrath for every bad thing you've ever said, every wrong thing you've ever thought, every sinful thing you've ever done. Jesus would take it on the cross. He would take God's wrath for that sin on the cross. He would die, he would be buried for three days, and at the end of three days, he would rise again. He would show that he had conquered sin, that he had conquered death, and now anyone who will believe in him, anyone who will trust him can have life, both now and forever. See, because Jesus stood against the tide of sin and death on the cross, you and I don't have to. In fact, you and I can't. But because of what Jesus did on the cross when he he was crucified and bled for you and for me, you and I no longer have to take that wrath if we'll trust in him. 
if we'll believe in him. So when we read the gospels, we see that the, the night before his crucifixion, that Jesus sweats drops of blood. And he sweats drops of blood because he knows what's coming. And what he knows is that the worst thing that's going to happen to him isn't that he's going to be nailed to a cross. The worst thing that's going to happen to Jesus isn't that he's going to be whipped with a cat of nine tails, which was this whip with, with pieces of stone and glass and bone, and they would tie him to a post, and they would take that whip, and they would hit him on the back with it, and whenever they would pull it out, the, that stone and, and bone and glass would, would sink into his back and would rip the flesh off. That's not why Jesus bled drops of blood. See, Jesus knew that, that he was going to carry that cross up to a hill and he would be laid down and he would be nailed one hand after the other and then his two feet and he would be hung on that cross. But that's not why Jesus sweat drops of blood. Jesus sweat drops of blood because he knew that in that moment, it wasn't the wrath of man that he was fearing, it was the wrath of God. Right? In that moment, Jesus was taking God's wrath so that you wouldn't have to. In that moment, Jesus was taking the punishment and the penalty that my sin and that your sin deserves so that you wouldn't have to. And that if you will believe in him, if you will trust him, if you'll put your hope in him, if you'll make Jesus your treasure, then life on this world is the closest thing to hell you will ever get. But if you reject him, if you deny him, if you refuse to believe, then life on this world is the closest to heaven you will ever get. See, what Jesus did by standing against the tide of sin and death in a way that Daniel never could, in a way that you and I never can, is he makes a way for us to be saved. And so I don't know you I don't know your heart. I don't know your background. What I know is that Jesus can save anyone. And so, so maybe tonight you're, you're saying, hey, I need to believe. Maybe tonight you're saying, I need to lay down my life at the feet of Jesus. Maybe tonight you're saying, Ethan, I need to stand against the tide. I need to rebel against what the culture has told me to be and what the culture has told me to do. And I need to stand with Jesus. I need to stand for Jesus. But guys, you've come to the right place, right? That's what we, we are here for. We're here to see you believe in, put your hope in, stand in Jesus. And so here in just a minute, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to sing. We're going to be dismissed to small groups. But before we do that, I want to give you an opportunity to trust Jesus. Now, here's what you need to know. That, that there's no magic prayer that you need to pray. That there's no magic words that you need to say. It's just about putting your faith in him. So here's what we do. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I'm going to pray. We'll go from there. Father, we are grateful for tonight. Father, we're grateful for this week. Father, I pray that you would use your word that we've looked at tonight to speak to our hearts. Because Lord, we know that, that there are some in here who, who want to follow you, who have surrendered their lives to you, but, but they're being tempted to not stand against the tide, but to go with the tide, to go with the flow, to go with the world. Father, I pray that you would give them the grace and the strength to stand against the tide. And Father, I pray for those in here tonight 
who maybe they've realized for the first time tonight that they need to trust you to save them. They need to put their hope in you. Father, I pray that you would you'd speak to their hearts, that you would call them to yourself. So guys, don't, don't look up, don't look around, but maybe tonight you'd say, hey, I need, I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to follow Jesus. Like I said, there's, there's no prayer that's going to save you. There's no, no right words, no, no magic incantation. But what we see in the Bible over and over again is that God hears our prayers. And so if you say tonight, Ethan, I believe I need to surrender my life to Jesus, then I just need you to pray something like this. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve wrath, but God, I trust that Jesus has taken it for me. And so Lord, I give my heart and my life to Jesus. I want to live and walk with him forever. Here's what I want you to do. If you prayed that prayer, I just want you to look up at me. So there's several of you who prayed that prayer. I had several of you who said, hey, I want to follow Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. If that's you, you're the one who prayed that prayer. Where's Pastor Mike at? See you in here. If you prayed that prayer, I just want you to walk to the back of the room. And Pastor Mike and Brandon will be back there. Just talk with you and follow up with you. Some of our leaders are back there. So if that's you, just get up and go. drag this out guys I'm gonna pray and we're gonna sing and we're gonna celebrate that Jesus saves um, as here here in a few minutes you're gonna go into your small groups and you're gonna hear that people from your teams or from your groups have trusted Jesus here's what I want you to do I want you to celebrate with them all right I want you to be excited with them. I want you to shout and cheer and all of that. I'm gonna pray and then we'll sing. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you that you save sinners. Father, we are celebrating about new life in Christ in those who have said, hey, I wanna give my life to Jesus tonight. God, we are so grateful that you save people like me. You save people like Mike. You save people like those in this room. And so Father, I pray that tonight is the beginning of a great move of your spirit. Lord, I pray for those in here tonight who maybe they say, I should have gone, I, I, should, have, uh, I should have gotten up, I prayed the prayer. Lord, I, I pray that you would continue to work in their hearts, you would continue to work in their lives. And Lord, that, that this week would be a time where they do business with you. And so Father, we pray even now that you would do what only you can do. That you would apply your word to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Can we all uh, stand to our feet as we just sing and just respond in worship to the word of God, what we just heard? And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory, Lord, for the battle belongs. Come on, sing it out. And I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see. Come on, for the battle. Come on, sing it again. And I'm going to see. For the battle, for the battle. Yeah, I'm gonna see. Oh, I wanna see it come. Yeah, yeah. For the battle. Sing, you take, you take what the enemy. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take. You take the enemy meant for evil. You turn. 